Well, hello, my beautiful family. Thank you so much for being with me here today. My name is Alan Rodriguez, and today we're going to be talking about God. First off, I do remind you that everything that I say on a video, I always write a post about it on our page, neverfarenough.org. So I invite you to please go there and read as I give much more details than I can give on a video. And second, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for you to get updated as, as new videos come out. So let's talk about God. The Bible is very clear in saying, actually overstating that God is with us, that God is relatable, wants to be with us, and his most important goal is to save us. But however, the problem with God, if you may, is that science has taught us to believe in that for which we have concrete evidence. So there's not, as science goes, there's not much concrete evidence to believe that God exists. But is this an accurate statement? Can God, can the existence of God be debated on an actual scientific basis other than the realm of personal experience? That's what we're going to be talking about in this video. I actually believe there is, and that's why I titled this video, Three Reasons to Believe There Is a God Other Than Personal Experience. And those reasons, those reasons or those cases in the scientific grounds are first, the case for the origin of the universe. Second, the case for the origin of life. And third, the case for the moral compass in humans. I do have to say, however, that God is a personal God as the Bible explains it and, and puts it, okay? So here's what I'm trying to say. Love is a beautiful thing. However, explaining love to somebody, uh, like it's really hard. You can explain love. You can talk about love. You can say how it feels, but it's not until a person actually feels it that they understand the concept of love and that love does exist. Kind of like fire too. If science says fire is hot, but it's not until you go and stick your hand in it and potentially burn that you realize, hey, science is right. Fire is hot. So what I'm trying to say is that no amount of evidence will ever come close to proof to you that God exists as actually personally feeling and relating to God. So it's not until you create that connection that God becomes real. All right, so let's get right into it. Reason number one, the case for the origin of the universe. And it goes like this. Everything that comes to exist has a cause. Things just don't pop into existence. In the early 1900s, Edwin Hubble and other astronomers discovered using telescopes this uh, effect, this phenomenon called the redshift in space. And basically the redshift is a phenomenon that occurs when galaxies are moving far away from us, far away from each other. So they said this, if at present time, galaxies are moving far away, if we go back in time long enough, all these galaxies come together in a cluster of galaxies or mass, if you may, and something happened, probably an explosion that sent everything away. And this is what came to be known as the Big Bang Theory, which proved beyond reasonable doubt that the universe did indeed have a beginning. It's so interesting because they, they proved, it took years to prove what the Bible had said from the beginning. The universe had an origin. Now, with the, the problem of the universe having a beginning is the question, what caused the universe to be? What or who in this case? I love it because science just get completely stuck. They can't provide an answer as to what exactly happened to cause the universe to come to exist in the first place. Robert Jastro, the professor and astronomer, said this, at this moment, it seems as though science will never be able to raise the curtain on the mystery of creation. And I just have to smile because science get completely stuck in something that the Bible said from the beginning long ago. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Very simple, very straightforward. What happened? The universe had a beginning. What caused it? God caused it because he created it. Now, are we to believe the Bible just because it says God created it? Well, first off, the Bible was right about the universe having a beginning. Now, the question is, is the Bible right about, about God? In Psalms 19.1, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. King David wrote this, and it's just such an amazing text because, I'll tell you why. 
because the universe, it doesn't take much. You just have to go out of your home and look into the sky in a very clear, dark night, or you just go to the NASA website or, or look at pictures or videos about space. And in, in the universe, there's no such thing as the millimeter or, or, or feet or, or meter. That doesn't exist in the universe. We use something called the light year. And one light year equals to six trillion miles. And our closest galaxy, Andromeda galaxy, is roughly about 2.5 million light years away. So you do the math, six trillion times 2.5 million, that is a lot, very, very, very far away, okay? So in a universe this big, almost infinite, where everything is in such an order in our own solar system, we're perfectly located at the right distance from the sun uh, for us not to be born or not too far away, for us not to freeze to death. Like the way everything works together, the, the beauty of the universe. I mean, you just have to go and see pictures. That is really, really hard that this enormous universe with all the beauty and the loss that rules it just came to be out of nowhere. It's, it's much more hard to have faith in that all this came out of nowhere than to know or believe that God did indeed create the universe. Okay, the thousands of it took thousands of years for science to come to prove that the universe had an origin when Bible said it from the beginning. I love how Robert Jastro says, now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The details differ, but the essential elements in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis are the same. Okay, so reason number two, the case for the origin of life. We all have heard the term evolution, and we most of all are familiarized with the fact that in 1859, Charles Darwin proposed or published his book, The Origin of the Species, which proposed the theory of evolution as we know it today. Very simply put, the theory of evolution states that long time ago, there was this single cell organism, a bacteria or some sorts, that evolved and modified through thousands or millions or billions of years, and it basically turned into all the living species that we now know today. Of course, the theory of evolution today is still just that, a theory. We have not yet found evidence to prove that it's true. But let's pause there because there's a bigger problem with this. If we all come from a single ancestor, where did that first ancestor come from? That is the true question. We all know from science that life comes from life, okay? So where did that first living organism came from? Science, of course, has, has tried to explain this with several theories, and one of the most accepted ones is the theory of a, uh, the theory of the prebiotic soup or the primordial soup, and it states that at some point in time the right elements find themselves in the right place at the right time. Things like ammonia, nitrogen, methane, all these essential elements uh, or compounds found themselves in the right place. There was an electrical discharge. This combined into to forming proteins, and pro that protein turned into DNA, and DNA turns into life. That just sounds kind of like a too good to be true scenario. Obviously, scientists have tried to replicate this, but all they, uh, it's called the Miller-Urey experiment, you can search it, but all they were able to prove is that you could potentially form amino acids from this kind of mixtures, ideal mixtures, which amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, but the, all they proved was that you can make from lifeless compounds, other lifeless compounds. Life didn't came to be. On top of that, proteins are very complex molecules. And astrophysicist Fred Hoyle actually calculated <clears throat> the odds for spontaneous life generation with about 2,000 essential proteins because life doesn't need just one or two or three, but several hundred essential proteins for life to be. So he calculated the odds for spontaneous life generation, taking into account 2,000 essential proteins, and the odds of that happening were one with one in 40, with 40,000 zero next to it. So basically virtually impossible, okay? But frustrated by the lack of evidence for this, then scientist says, okay, so life didn't create it itself here. It came from elsewhere. And this is what is called as panspermia. The idea that life came basically floating in space and came to the earth and then it evolved here. But of course, this also begs the question, where did that first living organism came from? So this still leaves us with the with the unanswered question, how did life start it? 
But let's pause for a second and let's just think, let's just accept the fact, uh, imagine that indeed life spontaneously generated. Now we, we have a huge problem and that is the problem of the fossil record. The fossil record shows basically fully developed organisms. Okay, we are yet to find a chicken in the process of converting into a dinosaur. Okay, we don't see that middle uh, transition between one species and the other. We have not found a concrete evidence for that. So the theory of evolution will, in my mind, forever be a theory. There's just no evidence to support that we all come from one single past common ancestor. Okay, so all of these theories and all of these uh, problems that science have tried to answer with some uh, explanations, all it proves to me personally is that indeed God created life because there's no way if you look, take a good look at life, how complex life is, how, how, how beautiful all the, all the internal biological processes are, biochemical processes are, there's just no way that this came to be just from a random uh, electrical mixture with the right compounds. It's just so hard. Life comes from life and God happens to be the living God. All right, reason number three, our final reason is humanity moral compass. And this reason puts us in the philosophy realm because it begs to ask difficult and deep questions such as what is life without God? What is the purpose of life? And why are there ethical and moral standards basically embedded in humans? A lot of people have tried to answer these questions and they have come to the obvious conclusion that life without God is meaningless. And it's meaningless because without God, there will be no drive, there will be no goal, there will be no hope, there will be nothing to look up, to, to like look forward to. Without God, we basically are born, we live, and we die. Like there's, there will be no point in doing good deeds or bad deeds on being good or bad because we'll have to focus on ourselves, do as much as we can as, like for as long as we want it to do before we just die and turn back to dust. And that's just kind of like an empty and void life. Scientists have failed to explain why, why things that are right, why ethical and moral standards haven't really evolved through time like they suggest life evolved in general. Things like, for instance, killing it feels bad. It has always felt bad. It's registered in history, and and it's something that uh, how how has that not evolved? Perhaps it's a question like things that are right in our minds. Again, in that embedded in that embedded mindset, feels right, and there are things that feel wrong that has always kind of felt wrong. I like how Genesis one twenty six puts and states that God created man in His image according to his likeness. So notice that there's two things here involved. Image, which, which talks about physical resemblance, and likeness, which talks about character. And now perhaps we can start making sense of the puzzle of why when we do right things, it feels right. And, and what is in our character that, that makes that happen that way. When we live according to the Bible, to, to the standards of God, when we live to resemble what Jesus did and the example that he gave us, how he lived so selflessly, love unconditionally, he served others, he helped others, he just lived for others. When we do those things, it feels so amazingly awesome. Like it just feels so right when we do and we live that lifestyle that I believe the reason why it feels that way is because we were created that way. God created, God put in us his mark, his character mark. And the reason why it feels so right is because, again, that's the way we were designed to be in a world where basically all other species abide by natural laws, where they're just looking to survive and to live day by day. The fact that we're rational, conscious, thoughtful, moral beings, it, it, it speaks that there's something special about us and there is the likeness of God. All right, so I hope that by now you've realized that, they are, that the strongest arguments that science have to prove that there is no God are actually arguments to prove that there is indeed a God. 
when we look at the wonderfulness of the cosmos, the, the beautifulness in the universe, when we look at the complex biological processes in human beings, in plants, in animals, when we look at the diversity that is in this world, the beauty that is in the natural world, I mean, it's just impossible to even fathom the idea that this is all a product of chance. You, my friend, you are not a product of chance. You are not some random biological uh, coincidence. You are, you were carefully thought in the mind of God. You were carefully designed for a purpose and God wants you to fulfill that purpose. That amazing creator beyond our comprehension wants to have a relationship with you as he wants to have a relationship with me. And he wants to fulfill your life to the maximum. He wants you to know that he exists, not because uh, we can prove it by science, but he wants you to experience him. That's the best proof that he can possibly give you that he is real. So I ask you right now that you pray, that you go on your knees and you give praise to this amazing being that created you and ask him to have a relationship with you. And I will, and I guarantee you that your life will forever change. God bless you. Take care. And as always, feel free to reach out if you need a prayer. If there's something you need and there's something I can do, we can do to help you. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, our webpage is, has a form that you can contact us. Uh, here on YouTube, you can comment. Just reach out. Uh, ask for help. Uh, if you just need to talk about something, we're here for you. Take care. And until next one.